folks. Welcome to another episode of Painting in the Basement with Happy Landscapes. I'm your host, Chris. I'd like to thank you for joining us this week and giving us a listen. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, what you're seeing, please make sure to hit that like button and also subscribe. Now today I'm painting Bob Ross's Cliffside. My daughter saw this one at the exhibit before Christmas and absolutely fell in love with it, so I'm painting this for her. And again, this is going to be the third installment of my sermon series. So without further ado, let's get started. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Now... When I read that, I was like, what a reaction. It doesn't seem a very appropriate response to being told that the Messiah has been found. Now here's a quick history lesson. Philip and Nathaniel were prominent disciples of John the Baptist. When John began proclaiming the arrival of the Messiah, they became very excited, no doubt imagining how fabulous this man would be. He was, after all, Emmanuel, God with us, a king of kings as promised by the prophets. Certainly, such a man would arrive with all the fanfare and glory that was his due. We would expect a more welcoming and praising reaction from such devout followers of God, but instead, Nathaniel lets loose with a very shallow and judgmental comment. I imagine if something like this were to happen today, it might go a little something like this. The media has been heralding the arrival of a great man, one who will save us from ourselves. He will cure cancer, stop global warming, do away with the two-party political machine, and find peaceful solutions to all the world's conflicts. The news stations have been rife with speculation about where this man will come from. Some say he will be a physicist from Austria. Others claim he will be an engineer from MIT. More far-fetched ideas say that he will come from the future or perhaps a distant planet. But they all get it wrong. When this Savior appears, those closest to him start spreading the news of his arrival. Hey, Chris, somebody says, we found the one everybody's been talking about. It's Jesus. He's from Florida. Now I'll go ahead and apologize for offending anyone. But that is kind of the point here, so I hope you don't get too upset. Florida, I think to myself, <laughs> you can't be serious. Nothing good comes from Florida. I mean, just think about all the Florida man stories. Now, I've known people from Florida, and, you know, they're not terrible people. But upon hearing that our savior was from Florida, I... I might pause to question the validity of the claim that mankind's savior was from such a place. Yes, it is true. I have a prejudice. In fact, I have a lot of them. We all do. I mean, you could substitute anything else in there for Florida or for Nazareth. Can anything good come from blank? What would you put in the blank? Some town near you? Or maybe something other than a place? The Republican Party. The Democratic Party. Or perhaps your prejudices are on a smaller scale. Maybe it's a family. I'm sure you all know that one family that you think to yourself, can anything good come from that crazy family? The truth is we all have certain preconceived ideas about people that we don't know based on all kinds of superficial qualities that we use to judge them. That's just human nature. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with us or that we are bad people. Even one of Christ's own disciples held such prejudices. The trick 
is to look beyond them. Philip's response to Nathaniel's incredulity was simply, Come and see. And Nathaniel went. He put aside his prejudice and went to meet Jesus and almost immediately declared him to be the Son of God. If we are to be disciples of Christ, we must put aside our prejudices and see people for who they truly are. It is right and just to acknowledge our preconceptions, whether they be based on skin color, socioeconomic status, religious beliefs, or sexual orientation, if, if, by doing so, by drawing our attention to them, we rise above them and get to know people based on, as the great Martin Luther King Jr. said, the content of their character. Greatness, when given by the grace of God, can occur anywhere, in anyone. The Old Testament is filled with stories of great men and women who came from lowly backgrounds, from poor families with lesser names, from the least of these. They constantly ask God, why me? I'm a nobody. Yet because they walked with God, they were able to achieve fantastic things, free their people from oppression, defeat their enemies against fantastic odds, and establish kingdoms that lasted for generations. Who then are we to dismiss anyone based on what we think we know about them? We are all God's children. But the story doesn't end there. As Nathaniel approached, Jesus calls out, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Ironically, Nathaniel responds with, How do you know me? Now, not moments before, Nathaniel has passed judgment on a man he has never met, yet questions Jesus for doing the same thing. Yes, Jesus has made a statement about Nathaniel's character before meeting him, but there's a big difference between what the two men have done. Had Jesus asked Nathaniel, how do you know me? Nathaniel might have replied, um... Well, I, I don't know you exactly, but I know other people from Nazareth, so you must be like them. But Christ answers differently. He says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now this is remarkably specific. We don't know what is so important about this or what he was doing under the fig tree. Some claim that he was praying or meditating there, but it doesn't really matter. Nathaniel's reaction is so strong, with an immediate proclamation about the truth of Christ's identity, that it must have been a profoundly significant moment to him. More importantly, this simple statement proved to Nathaniel without a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. Such a revelation, it seems to me, also proves that the moment under the fig tree was a very private one that no one would have known about. And here we have the difference between Nathaniel and Jesus. Nathaniel does not and cannot know the heart and character of others without meeting them, watching them, and talking with them. Neither can we. But Christ, being one with God, does. He sees our most private moments, knows our hearts better than we do. And he knows us, whether we have come to know him or not. God in Christ knows us from the very moment we come into existence. He knows who we are, knows our innermost thoughts and feelings, knows the secrets that we keep hidden from the rest of the world, sees every flaw, every failing, hears our darkest desires, 
knows every sin we've committed against him, ourselves, and others, and loves us anyway. Imagine that. For some of us, that may be a difficult thing to imagine. We may be so tangled up in our faults that we cannot believe we are worthy of such unconditional love. I have heard mutterings from people in my life who feel that way. At times, I have felt that way. Maybe you feel that way too. Maybe you find yourself doing things that alienate others just to prove how unlovable and wretched you are. Maybe you would say, can anything good come from me? The answer is yes. Because God still loves you, no matter what. In Plato's Allegory of the Cave, he wrote about the art of turning. I think there is some truth in this allegory, and it is applicable to our role as Christians. Using the image of a cave, the student is at the bottom enshrouded in the darkness of ignorance. Understanding comes only when one reaches the mouth of the cave and sees the light of day, or the light of Christ. But being blind, the ignorant are unaware of the light. The teacher cannot simply shout into the cave and tell the student to come out, because the student has no idea how to get there. Instead, the teacher must re-enter the cave and guide them out, step by step. Our job, as disciples of Christ, is to follow his example and love everyone. Not just our friends, our family, and those we share common beliefs and values with. We are called to love those who are drastically different those who lead lives that we find truly despicable. We must show kindness and love to the drug addicts, the beggars, the racists, and the criminals. We are called to love those who disagree with us, who despise us, and who persecute us. These are the students, those who are ignorant of Christ's love for them. If we reach beyond our prejudices by loving them unconditionally, we bring a tiny flame of hope into their darkness, showing them that a light exists. Hopefully, they will turn and follow, eventually basking in the brilliance of God's unending love. But they might not. We cannot force them to turn or change their ways. And this is the truly difficult part. We must remain with them, holding our candle and loving them no matter what. We cannot focus on the end result. If we become concerned about results, we risk disappointment, frustration, and letting our own light be overcome by darkness. Our priority, our zeal, is in the process, the doing, the loving. It isn't easy, and we can't do it alone. We must open ourselves to God's amazing grace because it is that grace which allows us to do incredible things, no matter who we are or where we come from. We are all God's children.
Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Painting in the Basement. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.